You never know what you'll run into in the desert. Let's see how long you can survive. This is Darkness Prevails, the place to share your true stories with the world, because this world is a strange one. The desert is hot, it's cold, and you probably won't survive if you get lost out there. But it might not be the temperature or the bugs that get you. It could just be the ghosts and the ghouls and the psychos that are out there looking for prey. Enjoy these allegedly true stories from the desert. Remember, you can send me your true stories with the links in the description. And I want you to know I've opened my own clothing store, Morbid Monsters, and everything there is just under $20. So support this channel and get yourself some amazing, creepy apparel at morbidmonsters.com or click the link in the description. Thank you. Real quick, here are the first five comments for my video, Five Creepy Creatures on the Road. Oliver Arroyo says, The best, my only way to escape life and have fun. Please don't stop ever. Thank you, Oliver. Let's just say my channels like your sentences. They just keep going without stopping. I roast you cause I love ya. Just Call Me Cat is back with some hot, hot soup. Must have made soup out of me if it's double hot. Aults underscore V metric says, feature me in your next video and a suggestion, a video narrated by Mrs. Darkness. She's much too shy to do that, but I'll be trying to work her towards it because I think that's a great idea. Alish Barana, Dolphin Senior PS1553 says, Hey, Darky Poo. Look, Alishba, what I do on the toilet is my business, okay? And Anel Kertik says, Of course we love you. I swear you guys are my only friends. Thank you. Now let's see if we can survive the desert. Number one, Smile Guy submitted by Hero. There's a prison north of Las Vegas, Nevada called High Desert State Prison. As you can probably guess, it's a prison surrounded by open desert. It's a dry and hot place. They have a prison boot camp program. It's basically like the military but graduation means a reduced sentence. They had the younger prisoners do military-style drills and pointless teamwork exercises like moving heavy rocks from one spot to another, things like that. I worked as one of the guards there, but I wasn't part of the boot camp. Nonetheless, this story became famous around that prison. You'll see why in a moment. Anyway, one inmate in particular was named Smiley Stan. They called him that because of the way he constantly smiled, as if his smile wasn't voluntary, but something that was etched into his face permanently. Before prison, Stan wanted to join the military, but he got into other things instead. He was a real oddball in the crowd. He didn't have any gang tattoos like the rest of them, and again, he was always smiling, as if he was happy to be there. His unflinching smile made him stand out most of all. He was a model recruit for the program. Smiley Stan got promoted to corporal and had small petty privileges and extra responsibilities, which he dutifully and proudly carried out. One time, two rival gang members were about to start fighting but Smiling Stan broke them up, stopping the fight without even breaking his smile or raising his voice. The other inmates had a strange mix of fear and respect for Smiling Stan. His oddly clean cut and calm demeanor kept his unit in line, and it often proved more effective than the drill instructors and guards around him. All the guards, in fact, spoke highly of Stan, and he was given a certificate of completion, ready to be released early from prison. Less than a week out of the program and back on the streets, he had an itch for the old crystal, if you know what I mean. 
He had stolen some things from one trashy looking house, then used what he found to break into another house in another nicer neighborhood that he thought was empty, only it wasn't empty. There was a five-year-old girl there with her 16-year-old babysitter inside. He broke through the patio door. He wasn't even trying to be quiet because he didn't think he had to. He didn't think anyone was there. But then a small girl came running over to investigate the loud and sudden noise. Unable to wipe the smile off of his face, he flinched and pulled the trigger. The babysitter was too scared to move. He just grinned at her and said, oops, my bad. I didn't think anyone was home. The babysitter fled without a response. When the cops finally showed up, he was found inside of the house. He was standing over the little girl, trying to put the pieces back together, saying, no, wait, I can fix it. He said that in a casual way towards the cops. His attempt at piecing her back together like it was a puzzle was interrupted by his arrest. When he stood before the judge, he merely smiled as he always did and asked, does this mean I'll lose my rank at the old boot camp? When he went back to prison, where he was placed in a segregated unit for the worst of the worst, his unflinching smile is still what makes him stand out most of all. Number two, I think I encountered a vampiric gin. Submitted by Ahmad S. This story occurred in Pakistan, more specifically in the middle of the desert somewhere south of Pakistan. Ever since I was little, I absolutely loved chickens and chicks. So my dad decided to buy me six baby chicks. Every day, we would let them roam in our yard at five in the morning. We would put them back in the cage at around seven. But one morning, when my mom went to put them back in their cages, she found them all lifeless. Their bodies were clean, as if there was no sign of a struggle, and there were no bite marks either. When my mother further inspected the bodies, she did find two puncture holes in all the chicks, all in the same spot, and they looked like they were sucked dry. She thought that it may have been a cat, but cats eat and play with their prey, and then they take it with them. There was nothing else she could think of, so she simply told me everything she could, that an animal, probably a cat, had destroyed my family of chickens. At that age, I was devastated. They bought me a parrot soon after, which is thankfully still alive. And later that same day, I buried the chicks and forgot about them. But that wasn't the scary part. That is yet to come. Because what happened next I'm 100% certain that it's related to what happened to those chickens. One night at two in the morning, I heard something running across the roof. It was insanely fast and very heavy because the whole house shook with every step. I woke up my dad, he locked the doors, telling my mother and brother, who had been awakened by the running as well, to stay quiet and inside the house. We didn't really own any sort of protection, so we just stayed inside waiting for it to end. The running continued until three in the morning. They then stopped, but whatever had been up there started making this otherworldly screeching sound followed by a deep and guttural growling. This continued until sunrise. When the sun rose, my dad went to check the roof but all he found up there was a cat, a lifeless and hollow cat with two tiny puncture marks on its neck. In my opinion, I think it may have been a djinn, a sort of spirit that lives alongside people 
that can take the form of different creatures or entities, but I may be wrong. Otherwise, there's not really a creature in Pakistan that hunts like that, so it doesn't really make much sense to me. What do you think it is? And should I continue to live in fear of whatever it may be lurking in the desert? Number three, Nevada House. Submitted by Carson F. This happened when I was eight years old, but the memory is still fresh. It still haunts me very much so. My parents went to an auction that my old school, Holy Spirit, was hosting. My parents won a vacation house in Nevada at the auction. And when I heard about this, I was so excited to get there. The house was in the middle of these very thin woods that were basically desert surrounded by more flat desert. Whereas in my mind before I saw the place, I was imagining something more lush, not this hot and dry place, but I was still excited. It's not every day that you can explore a new place you've never been to before especially a new forest, if you could call it that. We arrived. The house had old, gray, dusty oak wood planks for walls, two old, rusty windows to each side of the old, creaky black door, with a rusty doorknob to top it off, and the door had an old-fashioned window. Some really old and dusty stairs led up to the porch, and on that porch waited a gray, creaky wooden rocking chair an ancient relic, it seemed. My curiosity overpowered me like a 455 pound boulder. I grabbed my stuff and I ran out of the car, dashing as fast as a hungry ravenous cheetah could to the room I would be staying in. At first, I tried to call dibs on the master bedroom, but my parents weren't having none of that. The room I had though was massive, at least three times bigger in every way from my actual room, though that might be the only wonderful thing about it. The bed itself was old and basically piled on with rags. It was worn out beyond its years, but the pillows on top were surprisingly comfortable, and so was the mattress. And when I laid in the bed, I found this beautiful sky blue quilt that looked like it hadn't aged at all. The rest of the room, such as the old worn blue rug, a decaying oak wood desk, a cracked window, and a painting of an alleyway with lots of flowers. It was all ancient and matched the theme of old, you know. Excitedly, I unpacked my stuff and I ran downstairs. Soon after, my dad and I decided to explore the basement. When we got down there, we were horrified. There were chairs lined up facing the wall and a single dim light that we turned on when we went down there. I mean, it was a weird way to store the chairs, the way they faced the walls, the way it appeared like fluids had dried on the floor just below the chairs, as if a group of people had sat there facing the walls and cried or worse. It even weirded out my dad, who found it so creepy that when we got back upstairs, we locked the door and placed a temporary board over it, just in case. I don't really know what we were keeping out, but I just think he wanted to be sure. By nighttime, I'd completely forgotten about the basement. Maybe I'd just been overthinking it, I thought. We were in our separate rooms, my parents and I. I had my dog, Percy, with me, while Reagan, my big dog, went to sleep with my brother in his room. We also had my sister with us, Jane, and she had a room of her own as well. I slept in the room closest to the stairs. Jane's room was next to mine, and then Joey's, and then my parents. I stayed up late, doing a bit of reading, specifically the farmer boy from the Little House in the Prairie series. After about 30 minutes of reading, I fell asleep, but I woke up around two in the morning to the sound of someone banging on the walls. 
Percy was barking like crazy, and I could hear Reagan going insane. I left the room with Percy close to my side. Percy was very protective of me. I looked over to see Jane and Joey were awake as well, but somehow my parents were still asleep. Having loud kids like us, it wouldn't surprise me that they were such deep sleepers. After a few seconds, the banging just stopped. We didn't know what the heck it was, and we were a little creeped out, but we had no other choice but to just go back to bed and try to forget about it. The next day was pretty uneventful. We hung out together, played some board games, hiked a bit of the desert outside, had a picnic, nothing too strange happened. But that very next morning, at the very same time, 2 a.m., I woke up again to the banging, but this time we went to our parents' room and woke them up so they could hear it. By the time they actually woke up, though, the banging had stopped. This was even stranger. It was like whoever was banging didn't want our parents to hear, just us. Our parents irritably told us to just go back to sleep, that it was probably just the wind outside. The house was old, after all. We were obedient kids, so we listened to them. We went back to our own rooms. Only half an hour later, the banging started up again, louder than before, and I kept wondering why or how my parents hadn't heard it yet. How on earth could anyone sleep through something that loud? I met up with my brother and sister, and the three of us decided to check it out ourselves because we knew our parents weren't going to do anything. We braced ourselves, swallowed hard, and we made sure Percy and Reagan were close to us the entire time. We went downstairs and soon discovered something nerve-wracking. The banging was coming from the basement door. As soon as we saw that, it stopped. Now, this is where the story would be different from a movie. Because we weren't idiots, we didn't go down the basement to check it out. We didn't even go all the way down the stairs just to get a better look. We turned tail and we ran back to our parents' room. We woke them up, we told them what was happening, and we said we weren't leaving their sides. Luckily, they were too tired to argue, so they told us to just fall asleep in their bed. It was a tight squeeze, but we all managed to fit. After all, it was better than sleeping alone in a room in a very haunted house. Everyone went to sleep after that, except for me. I couldn't get back to sleep. I just laid there wide awake. Around three in the morning, I heard the TV turn on by itself. It startled me pretty bad. I woke my dad, who without a word just turned off the TV. Then he barely audibly muttered, it's not time for TV, it's time for bed. I rolled my eyes and didn't reply. A few seconds after, the TV turned on again. My dad just pressed the off button on the remote, but this time the TV didn't turn off. So my dad just stood up out of bed and went and unplugged the TV. Now you think that would be that, but the TV didn't turn off once it was unplugged. And finally, my dad actually reacted to what was going on. He was going back to bed when he could still hear the TV on. He turned around slowly with a look of denial on his face. And when he saw the static on the TV still going with the cord obviously not in the wall, he looked as confused and terrified as I was. Suddenly, he kicked the TV right in the screen. It didn't crack or anything, but it suddenly clicked off. He turned to me, seeing me as scared as I was, then said something that I knew he didn't even believe. Probably just uh, a bit of phantom power, you know? I unplugged it and it took a moment for it to go off. Uh, happens sometimes but not seconds after he said that, a music box that was on one of the old dressers began to play on its own without ever having been wound up. And I swear behind the music, 
I heard a child laughing. That was it. I think my dad decided that was enough. He woke up my family and he made us all pack up our stuff early. We got out of there as quickly as we could. Before we left though, I had to walk Percy and Reagan real quick so that they wouldn't go while we were driving. I took them around the house, but I made sure to stay within sight of my parents. And that's when I noticed a ladder that hadn't been there before. A ladder leading up to my parents' bedroom, right up to their window. I took the dogs right away back to the car. My dad ignited the engine and we got out of there at record speed. I don't know what happened that weekend. I don't know why there was a ladder leading up to the window or what was in the basement, but I never quite experienced the same kind of fear compared to what I experienced that weekend. If you ever went to stay at an old vacation home in Nevada in the middle of the desert, surrounded by sparsely interlaced trees, don't go there. Maybe just go bowling instead. Number four, the desert gas station or the reason I'd rather run out of gas than stop at weird gas stations anymore. Submitted by Rufus Sufus. I drove a pickup truck for a metal worker in my hometown for several years. I'd either be bringing him scrap metal from a scrapyard just out of town, or I'd be taking back what he couldn't use for spare cash. It was an easy gig. Just drove my pickup truck on a long stretch of desert road to and fro. The kind of job you'd gain weight from because you never got off your rear. Well, something happened that made me lose that job, even after how gravy it was. You see, I now have a very good reason why I'd rather run out of gas than stop at a weird gas station in the middle of nowhere. Sadly, after this incident, my boss basically gave me a choice of toughing it out or quitting. I took the latter. It was a late night. I'd been offered a double shift because the boss had a double order that needed to be ready for tomorrow. Basically, he had procrastinated, but I was there and actually needed the extra hours. I didn't even think about refusing him. He was finishing up his first project but he needed some metal ready for the next order. So I'd be driving into the scrapyard about 20 miles away, the one I'd always gone to, and picking up a last minute order from a very irritated junkyard man. That guy did not like to be woken up outside of business hours, but despite his anger, he loved my boss and would never say no to him. I think my boss was his bread and butter with all the metal he bought from the guy. Anyway, I left around 9.45 at night. It would be a 35 minute drive or so. Back then, I always drove the speed limit. I had a couple of strikes on my driving record, so I couldn't afford any more. So when I drove, I just accelerated to the speed limit and let cruise control do the rest. What I didn't notice though, was the fact that I was out of gas and I was already halfway to the scrapyard. I'd never had this problem before. You see, I usually had a routine of filling up in the morning if I was anywhere close to a quarter of a tank. But due to financial troubles, I'd been really stressed that week and my routine got out of whack. I drove up to the first gas station I could find. This was difficult for me because one look at the place and I had no idea if it was open, let alone haunted. It was derelict, seemingly abandoned. The only light I could make out was a bug zapper hanging haphazardly from the front awning. It took me a moment to see the dim flickering lights inside and a man in overalls with the silhouette of a uniform name tag on his straps leaning against the front door. To be honest, I didn't remember when or if another gas station would come along. So I stopped, pulled up to the gas pump and hesitantly got out of my truck. I walked up to the man, gave him a smile and a howdy, to which he didn't reply. I took out a $20 bill, then asked if I could get a 20 at the pump I parked at. He looked me in the eye, 
rolled his eyes, then snatched the 20 from my hand. He walked inside and then walked behind the counter. That was weird and rude, I said under my breath. Then I returned to my truck and began to fill it up. It didn't take long, really, but it felt like forever. I just wanted to leave and get the night over with. The place was weird, the guy was weird, and I was the only other person out here, or so I thought. When I looked into the window of the store, I saw the guy. He glanced towards me, then looked ahead into one of the supposedly empty aisles, but he was speaking to someone I couldn't see. Then he looked angry, like extremely angry. He threw some of the merchandise off the shelves behind him and seemed to be yelling at someone. When I saw him starting to walk back out of the store, my heart began to race. Oh boy, I thought. He walked right up to my truck and said this to me. My manager needs to see you, says your 20s fake. Immediately, my suspicions vanished. I'd be mad too if I just received a counterfeit bill. I was actually pretty mad myself because I had no idea how I got my hands on a fake bill like that. This was gonna make my delivery late and it was gonna make my night needlessly long and my boss mad. I completely understood. I said that to him and I began to follow him inside to sort this matter out. But as we walked up to the front of the store, I saw something in the aisles beyond the window. There was a hooded figure peeking out at me with gloved hands. When I saw the sharp object in his hands, I stopped. I, I don't think was all I was able to say when the man in front of me turned around, swung a wrench full force into my face. Luckily, I flinched and he caught me on the nose. My nose was broken, but I was conscious. I was conscious enough to shove the man away and I began to run back to my truck. The guy was thin, so he toppled over onto the ground. But then the hooded figure came out of the front entrance. By then, I was already back in my truck. I started the thing, then I floored it with the pump still in the gas tank. I ripped the nozzle off and raced out of there. Looking back in my rear view mirror, I could see the hooded figure standing there, motionless, and then the man was behind him, angrily throwing his hands up. I drove twice the speed limit to get to the hospital. Before I arrived, I called my boss to let him know what happened. His reply was actually a bit unexpected, he said he didn't care. He said that if we lost this account after all the work he'd done, that it'd be coming out of my paycheck. I simply didn't go back. The police later on that night checked out the gas station. Turns out the family that owned the place weren't even there. They said that they had locked it up for the night as this was their last day owning the station before they'd be forced to sell it so it was the first night they weren't open all night. However those guys were, they didn't work there. They'd broken in for whatever reason, and what they were planning to do with me, I don't know. But I want to thank the guy in the hood for revealing himself, because otherwise, I would have been blindsided the moment I walked in, and who knows where I'd be right now. The desert is a scary and lonely place. You'll get thirsty out there, thirstier than a 14-year-old me. You'll find yourself hallucinating at some point, and who knows what you'll see. Who knows if it's actually real? When the animals come to chew on you, you'll know for sure when you wake up. You'll know when you wake up with a level head, only to see that your legs are gone. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Remember to send me your true stories with the links in the description. And to prove that you're a huge fan of this channel, 
be sure to stop by my merch store for original creepy shirts you can't get anywhere else at morbidmonsters.com. Thank you. Also, a huge thanks goes out to my newest patron. They are Raven Wise. Thank you so, so much for supporting this channel with a little something extra. All of my patrons who support me are amazing people who are doing what they can to keep this genre alive. And to everyone who views regularly, you are the reason this channel still exists. Thank you all. To all of you, stay safe out there and stay creepy.